You guys hear me back there? Yes. All right, very good. Uh, welcome to the plenary session, honoring Frederick S. Lee, uh, who is up there now. And this is Fred Lee's website. I believe that many of us in this room know very well about the Fred Lee. Uh, but I also know that there are some graduate students who don't know about Fred Lee. Uh, he was the pre professor of economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. And he died last October. And he involved with most, uh, probably most heterodox associations for the past 30 years, including the Association for Social Economics. And also, he made tremendous contribution to the development of heterodox microeconomic theory. And now, we have four presentations for this session, but we are only three presenters. John Henry, couldn't make it to the conference because of the flight schedule. But I'm going to read the paper that John Henry wrote for this session. So let me start with my presentation, um, which is based on the introductory chapter of a forthcoming book, <coughs> Advancing Frontiers of Heterodox Economics, Essays in Honor of Frederick S. Lee. And probably you are seeing the flyers of that book. And also I'm distributing flyers of book honoring John Henry that I'm also editing. And both books are coming out in August. Uh, Right. Well, I'm Peggy Jo. Uh, my co-author co -author is Dzravka Todorova at Wright State University. She couldn't make it. And now, Fred Lee, uh, he was my advisor, uh, my mentor. And Dzravka and I are first two Kate students. And both of us graduated in 2007. And after the death of Fred Lee, there were a lot of tributes came in. So I collected all of them and I posted on his website so you can find those tributes. But I want to point out who Fred Lee was, using the many heterosynonymous words here. He was a remarkable man who played a unique role in heterodox economics of caring, affable, and optimistic person with a seemingly boundless energy and enthusiasm, an overly through and through, and a rebel worker who never abandoned the cause, and an inspirational teacher and wonderful mentor who taught students how to do heterodox economics. in a pluralistic, realistic, and integrative manner, and who cared about his students from the bottom of his heart. So you can read all the words from Heterodox Economics on the website. And to my understanding, his contribution to Heterodox Economics, economics are three main areas here. First building a global community of heterodox economists, and second, developing heterodox microeconomic theory, and lastly, practicing his radical ideas for social change. And I'm going to talk about the second, the, his contribution to the heterodox microeconomic theory uh, with regard to the, his concept of the social provision process. And in the John Henry's paper, and actually he talks about the first and the, the third, the building of the global community of heterodox economics, economists and practicing his radical ideas. 
related to the international workers of the world. So now, here's heterodox economics. Well, many of us know that he wanted to build an integrative, but now not all inclusive theoretical framework that is alternative to and independent of mainstream economics. And that is made possible by theoretical debate promoting critical pluralism and intellectual dynamism. Now his view of this, the developing an integrative heterodox economics is well addressed in his 2008 entry in the Palgrave Dictionary of Economics. Heterodox economics is not out to reform mainstream economics. Rather, it is an alternative to mainstream economics. An alternative in terms of explaining the social provisioning process and suggesting economic policies to promote social well-being. Now, He start with the concept of the social provisioning process. And actually, <coughs> this concept of social provisioning process was first coined and developed by institutionalist economists, such as Alan Gucci and Bill Duggar, and finally picked up this concept. And there is a reason, and I'm going to talk about it shortly. And in contrast, to the neoclassical view that economics is the explanation of optimizing individual behavior directed by the market price mechanism, the view of the economy from heterodox perspectives is the social provisioning process. So he's trying to establish a different view of heterodox economics, including social economic perspective, including the Marxian radical political economic perspective, and post keynesian institutionalist. So those ideas are included in this concept. And then what do you mean by the social provisioning process? And here is a quote from the Fred Lee and myself in 2011 Journal of Economic Issues article. The social provisioning process is a continuous, non-accidental, series of production-based and production-derived economic activities through historical time that provide many individuals and families the goods and services necessary to carry out their sequential reoccurring and changing social activities through time. But still, this concept is very vague. Now, then what's the reason that Fred Lee picked up this concept of social provisioning process in developing the integrated heterodox economic framework. The one particular reason is that if neoclassical economics is framed in terms of optimizing or isolated individual behaviors, we have to offer an alternative explanation of economic activities. Then, so there is one reason, and that could be the starting. So that's why the social provision process is the starting point, and also it has a merit in integrating first various heterodox traditions. My understanding, this concept of social provision process is completely compatible with the social economic perspective, and also Marxian institutionalist and post Keynesian perspective. The view of the economy the capitalist economic system. And also, uh, it has a merit of integrating both micro and macro analysis. We know that Fred Lee was a microeconomist, but he begins with the explanation of the entire economic system. So with the, the concept of the entire economic system, and he focuses on the subsystems and interactions between structures and agency within the entire system. So the heterodox micro, from Fred Lee's point of view, is not just micro as we understand. It is the integration of micro and macro analysis. And also, by uh, with this, the social provision perspective, we can integrate the social analysis and economic analysis. So he has developed 
the microeconomic theory in the context of the social provisioning process. In doing so, he had this some core components of his, his theoretical uh, framework. Methodological core is the critical realist and grounded theory approach. But I'm not going in details of this age course, but I'm simply pointing out those important things here. And theoretical course, the theory of merchant production in Marx and post-Keynesian institutionalist perspectives, and the, the social surplus approach found in the classical political economy and the Sophian post-Keynesian approach and the theory of the effective demand, Keynes and post-Keynesian, and methods are such as the Schroffer Leo TF input output matrix, and also Marxian social accounting matrix, and the institutionalist social favoring matrix, and post Keynesian stock flow acquisition model. He used all those methods to explain those how uh, economic activities take place in the context of the social provision process. Now, I believe that I have uh, five minutes, right? Then what are the implications of doing or developing heterodox economic theory in that line in, in Fred Lee's perspective? First of all, one of the important arguments he made in his career is that there is no conventional price mechanism as the organizing principle of economic activities. So he rejected the supply and demand framework. He rejected the marginalist principle. Then the question is, how are economic activities organized? And he argued that it is the capitalist class agency that determines the volume and composition of the social supports, which in turn derives the production of basic goods, employment, income, and the total social product. So in this short uh, statement, the social surplus support are integrated into the principle of effective demand. And more details uh, you can find in the paper in the book, a chapter in the book. And another implication is that class conflict in the Marxian sense, is explained in the production process of the social surplus. That is, the ruling class agency drives the production and distribution of the social surplus good. So when we say the heterodox micro, he always emphasized the role of agency. Agency is not simply an agent, like an individual consumer or individual business firm. No, agency is a capability of making strategic decisions. And those strategic decisions or power is defined within the social context. Now, for the implications, first, if heterodox economists wish to move their approach forward, it is imperative for them to engage in theoretical debates which would promote critical pluralism and intellectual dynamism within heterodox economics, and of focus on the social provisioning process sets the tone of a general framework encompassing various trends in heterodox economics. In a tactical sense, this promotes cross communication among compatible theories and thereby challenging theoretical sectarianism and dogmatism. In conclusion, the concept of the social provision process and heterodox analysis based on this concept still need for the articulation and elaboration. And one important lesson we can draw from Friedrich's work is this, with regard to the building heterodox uh, theories and heterodox communities. Build a system of work that promotes critical pluralism if heterodox economists wish to have a future. Thank you. Our second presenter is, you want to go second? Yes. Okay.
This Robert McMaster and his colleagues at the University of Glasgow about the social for injury and gardening. Yeah, I'm gardening. <laughs> <laughs> Uh oh, doing a lot down here. Oh, it's working. Uh, well, first of all, thank you. I've got to thank uh, Tahi for for inviting me uh, onto this session uh, and also for guiding me in terms of time. Uh, it was a, it's a it's a great honour to to address you all, but especially in the. In, given the, the, the subject of, of the session, uh, obviously Phil's, I wish Fred was here, uh, to discuss these ideas uh, that I, I, I have in terms of linking his approach to social provisioning with gardening, because uh, having known Fred for a long time, I've never seen him have any inclination towards things gardening. Uh, <laughs> but what I want to do today, when I was invited to, when I was invited to, to, to participate in this session, my thoughts were, were initially driven by, well, what can I say that's different about Fred? Uh, and what am I doing uh, currently? And also, is there something personal I, I, I can put in this? And uh, the personal comes from the, the, the location of, of this research, because the, the last place I, I saw Fred uh, was in Glasgow. He was in, his, uh, he was in his tour of the UK last summer. Uh, and there was an exciting atmosphere in Glasgow because it was the middle of the, the independence referendum, which Fred had, had some views on, uh, surprisingly enough. Uh, and uh, I thought that there is a rich literature in community gardening that social economists and economists generally haven't engaged in. It's been left to geographers, sociologists, political scientists. So I've been looking at this with, with my colleagues in the, in the business school, been looking at community gardening in Glasgow. So I thought that was a, a fitting subject, given that community gardening was seen or is seen by some as a mechanism for enhancing social justice, something that Fred was really passionate about. So that's really my rationale. I, I can only, of course, I can only speculate as to how tasteful or otherwise Fred would, would find being associated with this and also only speculate about how he would, uh, how he would feel about the analysis. Uh, a <clears throat> couple of pictures of, uh, of Glasgow and community gardens. I want to structure today by initially talking about what, what Tahi uh, uh, had uh, eloquently demonstrated, uh, Fred's passion for this notion of social provisioning. That was his analytical entry point as far as I was concerned. I then want to move on to associating this as some social economists are, are, are starting to emphasise, uh, Deb and Ellen being, being too, uh, associating the notion of social provisioning with capabilities and, and uh, more appropriately, well, well, usually associated with the likes of Martha Nussbaum and, and, and Amartya Sen. Uh, and not necessarily Fred Lee. But nevertheless, Ty, he did mention the, the notion of capabilities in his presentation, and then, of course, I latched onto it, yeah. uh, as a case of, uh, I think there is a certain resonance here, but you, you may have other ideas. And then I want to argue that community gardening in Glasgow does have a, 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 potentially economic, a potentially important economic role because it is enhancing, according to our study, it is enhancing people's capabilities in various ways. And I think as a consequence, Fred might look upon, like, look upon this endeavor in a, in a favorable light. Again, that's speculation in my part. So Fred uh, talked about uh, social provisioning uh, <clears throat> as being the heart of a, a, a heterodox economics that he wished would exhibit greater coherence, and he certainly strived towards that in terms of his own work. 
in, in micro theory as Tahi uh, ably demonstrated. For me, there are a couple of key points in, in Fred Lee's uh, description of the social provisioning process. And I think this has some resonance with the, the nature of the man's uh, own approach in terms of how he viewed uh, the economy and socioeconomic activity. The emphasis on structure and change uh, I'd like to place here, I think, talks to the relationships uh, between economics and society, power structures that obviously Fred was extremely interested in, cultural values, and also ethical frames. Uh, <clears throat> and I think that talks uh, enormously to us as social economists gathered here. And I think that's where Fred really, really fits in. Uh, as we saw, Fred's approach was rather, rather eclectic. As long, I think, as theoretical uh, approaches had some affinity with his broader overall references to social provisioning, uh, social surplus and so forth, Fred Woods rather accepting of this. Uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps, perhaps you may disagree with that, but that's certainly been my experience of uh, talking to Fred. What I'd like to do now is uh, try and emphasize uh, how social provisioning may well have some resonance with, with capabilities, certainly as I comprehend them. Now, I think the, the easiest way to demonstrate this is to go back to uh, the beginnings of, of capabilities in terms of Sen and Nussbaum and the philosophical underpinnings that are found in uh, Aristotle in the terms of the notion of human flourishing. I think that held enormous appeal for Fred. It certainly held enormous appeal in terms of Fred's activism uh, and the argumentations that, that uh, Fred made, certainly on a personal basis to me, uh, at, at many conferences we attended, uh, sitting up late at night, uh, putting the words to right. Uh, Fred would remember them with a degree of clarity that uh, certainly I wouldn't, uh, <laughs> if I can put it subtly like that. Uh, and I think I think Fred would have bought into aspects of the capabilities argument, certainly the philosophical underpinnings. And of course, there's a vast literature in capabilities that many of you have engaged in to a far greater extent than, than, than certainly I ever will. And of course, there's this emphasis in positive freedom. Uh, then of course we come to Sen's basic definitions of, of capabilities, which I think are fascinating, and this is perhaps where Fred may part company uh, with aspects of it. Because my understanding of capabilities is that Sen emphasized an equity in terms of basic capabilities. And I think, I don't think Fred would have been satisfied with this in terms of, uh, <clears throat> in terms of the enhancement of social reform and social justice. Uh, so there's a distinction between capabilities in terms of how a, a, an individual can be, uh, well, what they can potentially do, what they can potentially achieve, and functioning the realisation of those capabilities in SEN's work. And of course there are uh, wonderful scholars here, I'm looking at Irene and I'm just as well I've quoted you, uh, I've cited you, uh, who, are, who are critical of aspects of, of, of SEN's work. Now, I, I want to leave these criticisms aside because what I want to concentrate on is the, the broad message in terms of this resonance between Fred's notion of social provisioning, his passion for justice as he saw it, and indeed how this uh, can be articulated in a broad way via capabilities. Nussbaum may be closer to Fred. Uh, I'd actually be interested in, in, in your views on this. Nussbaum may be closer to Fred, uh, Fred Lee than, than Sen in that she articulates what has become uh, known as central capabilities uh, in, a, in a very effective way. And of course, we have a dispute between Nussbaum and Sen. Uh, Sen would rather not articulate these. Uh, Nussbaum has been accused of being imperialistic uh, in some respects. 
in terms of uh, not recognizing or paying sufficient attention to, to cultural specificities. Again, I want to park those issues and look at this in a broader frame. I believe in the, the spirit that, that Fred might have found appealing. Uh, and again, I emphasize this as speculation in my part. So when I was asked uh, to, to undertake this, or to, uh, this, this session with, with Tahi and, uh, and John and John, uh, I, as I say, was trying to articulate a, a vision of Fred uh, and Fred's passions uh, in, a, in a different way. And uh, I couldn't think of any, any better a way, or more different perhaps, than, than community gardening. Uh, now, community gardening has various definitions, and it's important from the context of uh, community gardening in the part of the world I'm from to differentiate it from the allotments movement, which is more individualistic, has a longer history, has ingrained property rights, uh, has a degree of legitimacy, legal legitimacy, that is not afforded to community gardening. It's also to, important to recognize that community gardening is flourishing in the global north as a consequence partly of the financial crisis. So community gardening projects in Detroit eh, are essentially providing an additional food source under the auspices of, for example, work in urban agriculture. Uh, there's work in Milwaukee, there's, there's community gardening projects throughout Europe. Glasgow is perhaps behind uh, many uh, post-industrial cities in this respect, uh, in terms of articulating a vision of community gardening. So we have uh, a definition of community gardening. Uh, I've got in the slide uh, overhead. What I'd like to emphasize about this is that community gardening is incredibly, heter uh, is incredibly heterogeneous. Its, uh, its governance is incredibly different. Uh, from one garden to the next. Sometimes there are employees, third sector employees, heavily involved. Other occasions it's entirely staffed by uh, volunteers and very much community focused. It could be a, a micro level, a street level even. The, the range and scope of these sites and projects is also very different uh, from one garden to the next. But what they do have in common is this urge to convene in a common space, reclaim a particular space, perhaps for the greater good. Now, in the literature in community gardening, there is a, there is a dispute, there's a recognition of the, of, of the tensions between this need to reclaim the space, the so-called reclaiming the space from the neoliberal uh, approach to development, uh, something that Fred might conceive of in terms of uh, a tension between exchange values as represented by neoliberalism and use values as represented by people actually using the space for a commonality. Uh, it might appeal and have some resonance with the Polanyian double movement, for example. Uh, and, and some of the literature recognizes this. But I think economists have been slow, and social economists, uh, and I include myself in this, have been slow to recognize the potential in community gardening in terms of a, an expression of solidarity. Uh, despite those tensions, and some of which I'll allude to uh, uh, in a moment or two. How much time do I actually have to? Seven minutes. Seven minutes, splendid. Let's get to the, uh, let's get to the, the case study in terms of community gardening. Glasgow, uh, as many of you will know, uh, in case you don't know, uh, I am from Glasgow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have a posh accent. Uh, Glasgow, as you may know, is, uh, was prided itself. I am always rather ambivalent about this. Uh, prided itself in being second city of the empire in the Victorian era. It was built in slavery. Let's be honest about it. It was westward facing. It was a relatively small town. 
uh, in terms of Scottish history, it was relatively unimportant. When it time came at the Treaty of Union, it was westward say, facing, and it benefited from the, the British colonies in America. That's the, the, the crux of it. Its geography mattered. And it built up industry rapidly, it attracted immigrants from the highlands of Scotland, from Ireland, and so forth, and in its own way became a bit of a, bit of a melting pot. Since, since the, the, the mid-20th century, Glasgow has declined. It's shrank in geographical area through political gerrymandering. It, the city has shrank in terms of population. Uh, it has some shocking health statistics uh, in terms of uh, people dying in the east end of the city. The average life expectancy among some males is 54. Unbelievable. Unbelievable in this day and age. Uh, now, for some community gardening, and, I, and I, I hope to demonstrate that in the five minutes I've got left, for some community gardening has a means, a mechanism for extolling benefits that may actually go some way to reversing this trend in lowering uh, or lowering life expectancy in certain deprived areas of the city. So community gardening projects in Glasgow and this again is by no means unique, actively involves third, uh, third sector bodies, charities in other words. The, 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 the organisations we looked at included very organised uh, groups, Lamhill Stables in the north end of the city, Urban Roots, very active in terms of gardening and uh, urban agriculture in the, uh, tending to be in the south side of the city. And this is engaged with education, so there's a learning element to this, Many school trips are made to community gardens, the larger community gardens, and also the local health service in terms of therapeutic benefits of these gardens. There is a wonderful garden where we conducted some interviews. Uh, one of my co-authors, myself, Andy Cumbers, uh, conducted in the Hidden Gardens, and there was a, a group of patients uh, who'd, who were, uh, had mental health issues. And, they felt pretty calm, you know, they were walking around the garden just relaxing, it wasn't raining for a change. Uh, so that enabled them. And, and some of the NHS practices, the local NHS uh, health boards are starting to recognise the benefits of this. So we conducted this study into uh, Glasgow's community gardens, recognising they were uh, extremely heterogeneous in nature. There was some. A certain ambiguities associated with this. There was a certain precariousness with their existence. And I want to draw your attention to the, the, the first point in terms of the ambiguities, in terms of where this argument, this tension arises between whether community gardens are assuaging or an excuse or a facilitator for neoliberalism in terms of space. In other words, they're taking space away from what the state should be doing and providing in the first place. And against that, in terms of empowering the citizen, empowering the individual, providing a new focus, something that the state has never done, certainly not in Glasgow. And this was magnified in terms of the, the local authority, Glasgow City Council, who have a policy and have indeed uh, attracted some funds or put some funds into where, uh, in trying to support the, the existence of community gardens allowing access and so forth. However, they also have to marry this against the development agenda. It's the use versus exchange value uh, approach and conflict that Fred might have uh, celebrated. Uh, in terms of the developmental agenda that Glasgow City Council face, uh, they, they have these, this range of derelict urban sites and many developers are keener to purchase this land if it remains derelict. So there is an interest that the City Council has in terms of trying to boost the exchange value of these sites by leaving them derelict. So there is this conflict within the, within the Council. Uh, in terms of other aspects of this, and I'll be extremely brief, there, were, there was a lack of knowledge about funding opportunities, there were knowledge gaps about the skills required to set up community gardens uh, and, and so forth. But nonetheless, nonetheless, our, our findings were generally supportive 
of community gardens in terms of the socio-economic benefits. In that, they were promotional, uh, promoting social inclusion. There were many disadvantaged people that were working alongside less disadvantaged people, as Glasgow were talking about, less disadvantaged people uh, in spaces that only this could occur. In other words, we'd never account, uh, encounter one another in, in, in everyday life. And that produced new friendships, it produced educational opportunities uh, in terms of learning to garden and in broader skills beyond that. It also raised the, the spectre of urban agriculture. The Glasgow diet is terrible. Uh, and this produced the, the possibilities of food security, food availability, fresh fruit availability. And it was very interesting how some of these community gardens subverted the price mechanism and the market mechanism and how they distributed any sort of surplus. Also, what was interesting is how few gardens actually engaged in ag urban agriculture and how few gardens actually measured what they produced. It was produced and then distributed to anyone who was there and some, occasionally some local residents. If people turned up, they were taught skills. It was very, some gardens were very informal in that. So the expertise was freely shared. There was marvelous examples of of knowledge transfers, as the management speak might put it. So overall, we felt there was an enhancement of both capabilities and functionings that the state should really support. But of course, the state body and the auspices of the local authority, Glasgow City Council, was divided on this. There was an internal tension between what it felt was the need to develop the city, increase revenues uh, from uh, new properties and, of course, to support such initiatives. I want to end with a, a couple of examples, uh, a couple of quotes from the, from the study just by means of demonstrating the potential of community gardens at an individual level and indeed group levels because it has a bigger impact on the most disadvantaged that actually engage in community gardening activities. And it's just something I feel that would resonate with Fred's notions of social justice and social activism. So we have one volunteer uh, who talked about having mental health issues and how the community garden was of considerable benefit to this individual. It enhanced their capabilities. I also think there was a, some unexpected ways that capabilities and functionings were enhanced. We have uh, an example here of how individuals started to think about governance issues and actually acquired skills in terms of organisational abilities. That would be readily transferable. For me, they are very qualitative and perhaps that's one of the reasons why economists have rather overlooked the powerful potential at an individual level and indeed a group and class level of community gardening. Uh, I thought this was rather poignant. This was in uh, what was the Gorbals. And in case you can't find, uh, see it from the, the photograph, somebody has put in a community garden this plaque, wish, dream, and hope. And I thought that was a fitting end. <laughs> Thank you very much. Our next presenter is John Shulkin, and he will be talking about interest, profit, and prices. I'll uh, have to sit down, I'm afraid. I'll move the chair over here so that uh, I hope uh, people can see.
Okay. 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 Ok
Kolesky's process of aggregating up from the um, individual sectors or the individual industries. Um, equation number one is the money value of output. Equation number two is a representation of the crucial fact that production takes time. It's the most simplest rep representation of the fact that production takes time that what I can think of. We map lagged labor inputs into um, today's output. Uh, here we define the, the terms. So the uh, uppercase P stands for price. Um, uh, uppercase Y is the real value uh, added in the, in the system. Pi is the money profit uh, in the system. I is the nominal interest rate. W is the average nominal wage rate. N stands for employment. Um, U minus one is what you might call the user cost of producing um, Y units of output. And then finally, um, A is the average product of labor defined in the sense that we just defined it. I need some more um, definitions. And I'm going to define two things, um, one which I'm going to call S prime, and the other which I'm going to call O prime. And S prime is analogous to the Marxian concept of the rate of surplus value. Obviously, the difference between this and Marx is there's an explicit interest charge in this concept of the rate of surplus value. And then O prime is analogous to the Marxian organic composition of capital. Now, this is an association whose members are very sensitive, shall we say, to ethical and philosophical issues. So I do want to stress that by using this Marxian language, surplus and so forth, you know, I am not preempting the ethical discussion. You know, surplus sounds as if it's sort of unnecessary, or the receivers of this surplus don't necessarily deserve it. Um, I, I, that we, we're going to talk about that later. But the point, the point that I'm, the, the reason I use this language, this Marxian language, is that the other group do not have a language, <laughs> you know, for, for these things. You know, so the only language that I know to describe these issues is the is the Marxian language, um, and that's why uh, that's why I say analogous to um, the Marxian rate of surplus value and so forth. Then big K, I can easily appropriate, um, uh, you know, uh, K to stand for the gross profit markup, um, because of course there is no such thing as capital, or to put it another way, the only form of capital is money. <laughs> uh, so I can use K um, quite easily, um, and. Uh, uh, you know, that is the gross profit markup, gross in the sense of gross of depreciation. So, um, if we then move on. Um, so, obviously, you can just substitute all these things in, um, and you, you get um, a, a, a money value equation number nine. Um, and the price equation, I guess, corresponding to that would be number 10. Um, and uh, it describes the components of price, you know, including, including an interest charge, which is important. Um, obviously, um, uh, you know, wages and obviously the, the, the profit uh, markup, those things all sort of go into or include price. Now we need some further definitions. I'm going to use lowercase uh, k to be the log of one plus big K, uh, the log of one plus the markup. R is the real rate of interest, with lowercase p, by the way, in that definition standing for the inflation rate. Lowercase a is the log of uh, the average productivity of labor. And lowercase w is the log of the average real wage. Um, therefore, we can reduce this to a simple adding up theory, um, and we can move straight to number 17, where K, remember K is the log of the market factor, is equal to A, which is the log of labor productivity. R minus 1 is in some sense the real interest rate. I mean, in our simple model, it's just the real interest rate. Um, when we're trying to my students, of course, have to face with the, the task of putting empirical 
a face on this. So you might have to have you know many more lags, shall we say, to take account of the structure of production and so forth. We'll, we'll come to that in a minute. And then you know lagged the la lagged average real wage rate. So an equilibrium, or well, I shouldn't have said equilibrium because that's a misleading term in this context. In the steady state, I should say, uh, obviously this would be the functional distribution of income. Now, um, yeah. So uh, notice that um, that uh, this description of income distribution is specifically about the functional distribution of income. It's about the distribution of income between the profit markup, if you will, the what, what we call it, um, you know, entrepreneurial capital, you know, the, the market, uh, entrepreneurial capital. Obviously, wage is the return to labor, R is the rentier um, share or um, uh, return. Um, it does not deal with what some people here are very interested in, uh, it does not deal with the personal distribution of income. Okay, um, uh, it, it, uh, i.e. equality versus inequality on an individual level, nor does it deal with questions of, so to speak, um, social justice, unless and as far as these categories map into um, social categories. It, it does not deal, in short, with the, the income distribution of social groups, you know, as such. So it's definitely the functional, functional distribution uh, of income. But that's something which I, I, in my view, has been sadly neglected uh, in, in recent times, both by the heterodox literature and also by, certainly by the uh, neoclassical uh, literature. Um, what can we say about the ethics of income distribution here? Well, I mean, obviously that's a large topic, um, but I think we can immediately sort of address, shall we say, you know, what would be the Marxian take on this? You know, in, in Marx, there's ex as long as there's a positive R and as long as there's a positive K, there's exploitation. <laughs> you know, the, the exploiters are the, um, uh, the, um, the industrial capitalists and the financial capitalists. And in a sense, you know, obviously, presumably the desiderata of the Marxian world would be W equals A. The, the producers um, get all of the income. Now, in uh, some people are concerned with the problem of usury. That is to say, um, I mean, Mario was going to talk this afternoon about you know rancher income. Um, I think that if one was against usury per se, you know, taking of interest at money, obviously you would try to set R equals zero. Now that. You know, so so um, for example, um, I mean, obviously, my real interest rate rule. I mean, as people may know, my real interest rate rule, the ultimate optimum of that would be a real interest rate of zero, not, by the way, a nominal interest rate of zero, as in Kansas City, because of course that would lead to instability. But if the real interest rate is zero, then um, there is no usury in in that sense. However that would give um, um, legitimacy to the profit share. You know, in, in, in short, you know, none of the output would be uh, going to uh, Rantier, shall we say, but there would be um, capitalists in the sense of industrial capitalists. I also think that this is quite similar to um, the notions of Islamic banking, which would do exactly that. They would, uh, again, yeah, one possible interpretation of Islamic banking is the idea that the, um, the interest rate, and I, again, I, I would say it should be the real interest rate, um, should, be, uh, should be set at zero. Now, that's a huge topic. I'm, all I'm saying is that we could use this uh, little equation to discuss those, those issues. Um, what's of more um, interest to my oh, no. <laughs> Interest is perhaps the wrong term. What's of more of, what's happening? I, I can't see anything on my screen. Touch the screen. Yeah, touch the screen. Touch the, touch the screen? Oh, it's just blocked off. Because I wasn't doing anything with it, was I? 
to hear, but <laughs> And then we have to go ahead. Yeah. Just, 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 my students, of course, um, are faced with a slightly different problem, not sort of figuring out the ethical implications of that notion of distribution of income, but they're of actually giving empirical um, uh, reality to, to that theory of income distribution. So my next overhead simply tries to um, illustrate um, you know, how we would get uh, empirical observations. And you know, most of them um, are there. Um, this interest rate one is, is interesting. Um, I mean, what you would really have to have, I think, um, I've called it R minus one, but what you would really have to have is um, some kind of figures for rentier income, total rentier income as uh, a percentage of nominal GDP. And then you would have to have some kind of measure of total nominal wealth. And again, in this case, both in quarter one, and the definition of the interest rate that we would use, the nominal interest rate we would use, is those two um, incomes. Now, it so happens that in Canada, um, we do have those two figures. So one of the things that we can do is simply just use um, the R minus one term, the Rantia income nominal GDP, and the nominal wealth term, and that becomes our interest rate measure. Now, it's not interest rate as conventionally understood, because obviously, in the variety income series, that, for example, some dividends are included in there and so forth. But maybe that gives a, a good idea of what we're actually looking for in terms of the, uh, the real world. Um, my students have had reasonably good success with, um, oh, again, I shouldn't, uh, it, if I should just click it here. Yeah, with um, empirical um, uh, wage functions, um, the one that's most interesting for, uh, for Canada, obviously, um, is this one. Um, to explain lowercase y is the growth rate of GDP. Um, Q is the uh, log of the real exchange rate. And um, this thing works quite well um, in, uh, in a number of uh, countries as an empirical uh, description of wages. So my students, as I say, have to do these last uh, two slides. I guess the interest for this association would be more in discussing the uh, <laughs> ethical implications in, in the equation itself, um, that kind of thing. And that's it, I, I finished my time. Yeah. Right, so thank you for it. On behalf of John Henry, I'm going to read his paper. It is five page long paper, so it'll take about 20 minutes. And John Henry has slightly modified his the title of his paper. Now it is Friendly, the Industrial Workers of the World and Heterodox Economics. <clears throat> I first met Fred Lee in the flesh of, in 1985 at a post-Kingdom conference in Tennessee. At a conference dinner, we found ourselves sitting next to each other, and the industrial workers of the world somehow entered the conversation. For the next 15 minutes or so, all we talked about was the IWW, Big Bill Haywood, Mother Jones, Eugene V. Dapps, Joe Hill, and other notables associated with that organization. Fred had joined the IWW in that year and maintained his membership until his untimely death in 2014. Well, I just want to show a picture 
uh, taken a month ago. So probably some of you guys know this Haymarket Monument in Chicago. And this is ashes of Fred Lee. And on top of this is the this is IWW member's car. He collected for the past thirty years. It was May 2nd. He was not just a mere member, content to demonst demonstrate his love royalty by paying dues, but to the extent possible in a now small and rather ineffectual organization, did his best to keep the memory of the IWW alive. There are a number of people in the audience who were scheduled on a yearly basis to purchase copies of the IWW calendar. I have a copy of that calendar, 2015, Solidarity Forever, IWW calendar. The latest features a commemoration of Joe Hill. This is Joe Hill and the Obli Bard. Three anecdotes follow, and then I will turn to the main theme of this discussion. In 1988, then chair of the General Executive Board of the IWW, Fred retrieved the ashes of Joe Hill from the National Archives in Washington, D.C. These had been seized by the U.S. Post Office during the infamous Red Scare instituted by the U.S. government toward the end of the World War I. Hill's ashes were then distributed to the various IWW locals still in existence. In 2005, Fred organized at the University of Middle Kansas City a small conference to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the founding of the IWW. And this is the only such conference I'm aware of. As conferences go, this was a piddling affair and papers presented would hardly add advance on standing in traditional economic department. Yet notable members of the heterodox community were in attendance, several traveling from Australia, England, and length distances in the US. Curious, I asked a few, why? Why undertook the journey and expense of coming to Kansas City for such an event? To the latter, the answer was, we owe it to Fred. The Heterox Economics newsletter had been organized by Fred the, the previous year, and people were so grateful for this sole means through which economists of our persuasion could communicate in a structured fashion that they owe it to Fred to participate. On May 2nd, Fred ashes were scattered at the Haymarket Martyrs Monument in Forest Park, Chicago. Here, his remains join many others who have fought the good fight and have lost so far. Now, what does the IWW have to do with heterodox economics and Fred's place in this development? In addition to his work in basically every heterodox association, Fred was the main force in the formation of the Association for Heterodox Economics. And it is in this organization that we see a connection to the IWW. The IWW was structured along the, along the lines of the Chicago form of organizing. No single orientation was demanded of its members, but all members had to adhere to a general position that the main objective of the organization was to emancipate labor from wage slavery through the elimination of capitalism. Hence, the IWW enlisted Marxist, anarchist, radical trade unionist, etc. in the formation of the industrial, rather than craft, unions in working toward that objective. All were loosely socialist or adherents of a cooperative, cooperative commonwealth, but no specific political program was put forward as the only correct path to follow. The main point was to bring the disaffected, discontented, and outcast together to work for social change. The AH has adopted this approach in attempting to fulfill its mission. 
it does not restrict its membership to those hewing to a Marxist, institutionalist, post kingian Sophian, or any other heterodox theoretical orientation, but welcomes all, with the exception, of course, of straight arrow neoclassical economists, through though even though even those adhering to neoclassical line are welcome if they are willing to engage in pluralist discussion and debate and to learn from heterodoxy. That is, the AHE, through open discussion and debate, seeks to develop something of a synthetic approach to heterodoxy, one that will advance this program through an ongoing dialogue among non-mainstream economists. As long as the main objective of emancipating economists and other social scientists from the intellectual slavery of conventional economics is accepted and the long-run goal of working for a society in which social provisioning is the main objective, all are welcome. After all, we are the disaffected, discontented, and outcast of the economics order. It might be noted that it was difficult to categorize Fred himself when some days he was mainly a Marxist, on others, an institutionalist, a post Keynesian, a Sophian. In parenthesis, I've even accused him of being a quasi Austrian. <laughs> Let us return to the IWW and its heterodox credentials. If one turns to official IWW publications, one finds a close affinity to Thorstein Veblen. Now, if anyone is a registered, card-carrying heterodox economist or a social scientist, it is Veblen. The industrial workers of the world a vanguard of dissent was organized in 1905, and Veblen had a very close relationship with this red color organization. The IWW emerged as the most militant, radical, anti capitalist organization in the United States, particularly as the official Socialist Party had become increasingly conservative. In 1918, Veblen was hired by the Food Administration to investigate agricultural conditions in Western US. In his memorandum to the administration, the title was the Farm Labor and the IWW, Veblen argued that, contrary to the standard propaganda of the day asserting that the IWW was responsible for shortfalls in agricultural output what the members of the IWW wanted was simply good working conditions at decent pay and an end to the harassment meted out to them by government officials, state councils of defense, security leagues, and committees of public safety. All of these associations represented instruments of terror aided and abetted by the US government in smithing Red color organizations in the World War I and post war period. The relationship between Valen and the IWW goes further than his evidence of support for the organization in the above memorandum. The IWW itself was very sympathetic to Valen's theoretical analysis and called for reconstructed social order. In an official IWW publication, the general strike, Ralph Chaplin specifically uses Veblenian language, for example, the vested interest in framing the IWW position and right. This is a quote from uh, Chaplin. It looks like a far cry from Bill Hayward to Thorstein Veblen, uh, the non conformist labor leader and suave and erudite professor made on common ground in advocating the general strike. Not only is it true that Professor Bevelin is in perfect accord with the industrial philosophy, program, and methods of the IWW in regard to the general strike, but the preponderance of com competent technolo technological opinion of America favors that 
viewpoint also. The advanced technician sees in it the quickest and most dependable method of keeping the vital process of production and transportation unimpaired during the impending breakdown of the system of production for profit. Further, during the wartime and post-war hysteria mounted by the US government, particularly in the establishment of Justice Department, uh, creation of the General Intelligence Division, the Radical Division in Common Plans, Verlin came under investigation. An initial investigation was launched in response to the publication of the Nature of Peace. Strangely, because of its supposed pro-German sympathies, his Imperial Germany and the Industrial Revolution was sometimes coupled with the former book. While such a charge was silly, to say the least, what was not silly were subsequent charges that he was closely allied to the IWW. And this organization had been singled out, singled out for a vicious attack by government forces as it was comprised of undesirable citizens. Indeed, for all intents and purposes, the government destroyed this organization in the immediate post-war period. This was the first red scare. Further charges made by private citizens that were duly investigated claimed that Veblen was Bolshevik and was acquainted with Lenin and Trotsky. While these investigations never reached fruition, they do indicate that Veblen had a strong enough relationship with the IWW and was sufficiently sympathetic to Bolshevism to warrant the attention of the state apparatus. My last point on this relationship is that when 100 IWW members were persecuted in Chicago on charges of obstructing the military draft and hampering the war effort, Veblen signed an appeal soliciting funds for their defense. Not too much should be made of this, as it was also signed by others, John Dewey among them, who had no affinity for, that, for the organization. A few words must be said regarding the inclusion of the engineers of the common man category. In much of his work, Veblen demarcated the social order in a division between common man, workers in the main, and the leisure class, or absentee owners, essentially capitalists and their hired lackeys. One might include neoclassical economists in this set. In his Engineers and the Price System, 1921, Veblen included engineers in his common man classification. I do not here intend to become involved in sometimes lengthy debate among institutionalists on that matter, but merely point out three issues. Initially, note that the IWW, clearly an organization of the common man, had no concerns in including the advanced technician in their ranks. Presumably, advanced refers to their progressive political orientation. So some engineers were seen as sympathetic to the objectives of the IWW. Second, <clears throat> The actual training and work of engineers is directed toward the industry or the machine process. This can orient them toward the same objectives of workers in the industrial enterprises, serviceability, or the social provision process. In the US, at least, in the last part of the 19th century, training programs in leading schools of engineering, MIT for instance, increasingly were geared toward cost profit objectives as primary in order to minimize exposure to liberal arts programs that might promote interest in the common good. But what is true in the US is not necessarily true in general. 
though this is an issue that can only be addressed empirically. It does partially explain, though, why so many CEOs come from an engineering background, particularly if they marry their engineering training to degrees in business administration. Third, in Valence period, there were movements by engineers to break away the pecuniary interest of absentee owners and focus their work on machine process or industry. One such group was the New Machine, founded by Henry Gaunt, an engineer influenced by Veblen and friendly with Leon Arzurini, a student of Veblen's, who edited the, collect the collection of Veblen's papers, essays in our changing order. Gaunt wrote, we can no longer follow the lead of those who have access to grind, disregarding economic laws, but must accord leadership to whom, him, who knows what to do and how to do it for the benefit of the community. This man is the engineer. <clears throat> Maurice Cook was another engineer who associated with Veblen as vice president of the American Society for Mechanical Engineers, Cook led a faction of this organization dedicated to reforming the society and serving its ties to business. By 1919, this association did break its connections to big business and developed an ethical code which specified that the first professional obligation of the engineer was to the standard of his profession, not to his employer. So while many, probably most, engineers of Veblen's day were politically conservative and primarily oriented toward pecuniary interest, others were progressive and oriented toward the machine process. And it is this segment that Veblen included in the ranks of the common man. This is not equivalent to those technicians of heterodox economics who strive to make this a better place in which to live. Now, Fred was not a student of Veblen. Indeed, at some point, I finally got him to read Veblen's theory of business enterprise. Fred remarked, there's nothing new here. It's all been said. I, John Henry, reminded him that Berlin wrote the book in 1904. And one of Fred Hewitt's Guardian Means drew from Berlin's work in his own approach to administered price, prices. That is, the book was written early in the century before all the work on administered prices that followed followed the World War I. Fred said in so many words, oh yeah. <laughs> but this doesn't really matter. What does matter is that Fred was in accord with IWW principles, and this carried over into his life's work in developing a viable alternative to conventional economics. His attention to the development of students who would carry on this duty, but more importantly, to his commitment to making this a better world for the majority of the population. Those who had an actual interest in the social provision process in a viable, decent form of social organization in which people could actually become human beings. And that is not the word of a capitalist order. I close with a quote from Fred, dated October 2nd, 2014, shortly before he died. Actually, this was an email uh, sent out to many heterodox mailing lists on October 2nd. Here's a quote. In 2015 Solidarity Forever Labor History Calendar, this one, is now available. 
It features Joe Hill. If you do not know who Joe Hill, Joe Hill is, I suggest you do a little bit of work and find out, or better yet, home to yourself. Would you have freedom from wage slavery? You either work the work or you do not. And my career has indeed worked the work to ensure that heterodox programs exist and heterodox economists have jobs. And this has meant significant hardships for students and colleagues. To critically study the mainstream theory that calls into question the argument that supports the 1%. And it also means that you have to go beyond the critical and develop an alternative that draws upon the different heterodox approaches. Do something. Give a damn. Thank you. Well, okay. We take some questions and comments or call and projections. Questions? questions? Okay, John. This is just to be a little light, but what you might share with your Glasgow uh, gardeners is an old dictum. If you want to be happy for a few hours, get drunk. <laughs> If you want to be happy for a few years, get married. If you want to be happy for the rest of your life, take up gardening. <laughs> <laughs> Questions and comments? Well. So uh, my question's for John. And I guess, uh, you know, one of the things that I loved about working in your friend Lee was that, um, and this is something that you were talking about, how prices in the capitalist society actually fill out, like they reflect the functional distribution of income in that society. And they act to kind of uh, reinforce those differences between like capitalist rentiers and workers. And I think that that's a, an important point that you made in your presentation. But one of the things that I like to see uh, maybe you can talk to us a little bit about it is how how you know what you're presenting in terms of the recession of prices within the steady state, but uh, there's always conflicting claims on the surplus and, and that pushes prices in a certain direction and also pushes the distribution of income in a certain direction. How that might be linked to the personal uh, distribution of income rather than the functional how there's like I guess right now like in it, in my mind, I'm working a lot on trying to reconcile, like, how can I look at the relationship between the personal distribution of income and how it's related to the functional distribution of income? I think it's uh, something that the Germans are working on too right now, and I don't know, it's kind of complicated to work on. Do you have any ideas on how to work with that? No, I don't have any ideas on that, but obviously that's sort of the next step, and then I'm going to that you're working on it. I mean, obviously, my interest is how, so to say, the capitalist system works and functions. What you're more interested in is how individuals kind of fit into, or indeed, if you like, how social groups fit into that capitalist system. But, but can we make general statements about um, you know, who are the, um, the industrial, the industrial, that's, that's got my interest, who are the entrepreneurs? You know, can we make general statements about uh, who are the landscapes? I mean, as a matter of fact, we mentioned workers' pension funds, and then we discussed in the session this morning. Government, aren't government, aren't those recipients, including ourselves, and the university pension funds, aren't we also not yet? Right, but that really? is. Excuse me. So, I mean, how do you. How do you distinguish yeah, yes. who's a rentier if you're a worker and you have your pension? Yes, yes, yes. yes. I mean, Keynes said um, the same, now you'll have to excuse it's the same man, they deal, invest, and what's the other thing? And earn. Um, um, 
And uh, you know that's why he was interested in the, the functionalism. It would basically, it, it, it would affect incentives to engage in, 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 in all sorts of activity. You know, for example, if you can make a lot of money speculating on the stock market, that's what you'll do, as opposed to taking the gun. Uh, um, but but um, my own opinion is that in most societies you can actually, I mean obviously in the societies that we're looking at, you know, the society that came, where all this theory came from, you can pretty much identify also the personal distribution of income with the functional distribution. You can almost slot people into the different parts. How do you do that today? I mean, I mean what are your ideas? No, I mean, I, yeah, no, I, guess. I, I mean, no, but I mean, how, how would you do that? Well, the way I do it, or the way I'm thinking about George Hamilton and then what the work it on it is, uh, is to say, like, you know, you look at the distribution of income and you say, okay, people who are at the top, they're entrepreneurs, and people who are below, that, during, you know, middle of the income group, they're going to be workers and lower. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, so, so we're sort of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's how you map it in, but I mean, between the tiers, but, but I don't want to draw too long on that either, because it's about. Bradley, but I think that that's the really, like one of the cool things I think about Bradley's work and which are which are talking also is, yeah. is clearly that the prices at the micro level are a reflection of the distribution of income and they perpetuate that through production process. I'll say one other thing though, what this problem it illustrates is the need for what Jim Ingham would call the social theory of value. Right. You know, um, which means precisely that the income distribution goes into prices. You know, the social theory, the, the, the theory of value that you have with that is precisely the thing that the class struggle, to use an outdated term, and uh, that sort of thing. It therefore militates against the pure labor theory of value, but it certainly militates against a utility theory of value. Um, but again, you know, we often use the expression of social theory of value. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, was, it, was, it needs to be done. Um, uh, I think that's the way to leave it. Okay, any other questions? Comments? Uh, I happen to have uh, actually met uh, Fred Lee uh, without realizing that I had met him. <laughs> so to speak, that was who he was after, uh, in 1977. Because I happened to attend a, a conference. So in fact, the first time I ever attended a post Keynesian conference at Rutgers University, and there was Al Eichner there. <laughs> It was uh, well, Paul Davidson was the one who was organizing it. And uh, I remember very clearly uh, uh, speaking to Al Eichmann, who had a lot of influence on me because my thesis was a, had a lot to do with what he was researching on at the time. I was trying to do the uh, thesis on, on pricing as well. And then I, I, I happened to have talked to Fred Lee. He, he said I, he, he was convinced he had seen me, that, uh, which uh, we just found that out, I think it was in September last year, when I was chatting with him over that. And uh, now the reason why I'm, I'm saying all this is because we've been using different vocabulary uh, at the time. Uh, and I remember we came out even with a special issue of a journal, which was actually a French-Canadian journal called Lecture in 1982, where we, uh, we published an article by Eichner and the other at the time. And uh, in that article, now we emphasize the fact that price uh, uh, has ultimately to do with the issue of, of, of reproduction, you know, social reproduction. Now, you may want to call it social provision, but I think we're talking about the same sort of thing. Okay? And uh, Eichner himself you know, made some rather important contributions. And Fred Lee, ironically, wrote to me in 1985, for the first time we had ever had contact, 
where he asked me for a copy of the article that I published, which was a kind of long piece that was derived from my thesis at the time, on exactly that question of pricing. And along Eichner kind of lines in this case, which is that for him, markups on these costs, however, like for instance, the way John was referring to it in terms of what are your prime costs versus what are your you know, whatever the markup covers there, whether it's include interest rates or not, how you could disaggregate that, that, was all about trying to argue how, in fact, you were able to point to the relationship between that markup and the need not only to satisfy whatever target returns that businesses wish to cut, including covering interest costs or the rentier returns or whatever, and other overhead, and at the same time also ensure some sort of sufficient growth in the system derived from some sort of desired investment you know, that was connected with, to some extent with self-financing. Now, all that aspect, in a sense, uh, that we were talking about in those days, okay, uh, has kind of perhaps changed in vocabulary to some extent. But I think we were talking about exactly the same sort of things. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, what I find uh, uh, unfortunate with what John was doing was perhaps not to connect it with exactly some of these people at the time. Like, I mean, Alfred Eichner was, uh, was Fred's uh, supervisor, PhD supervisor. Of yeah. uh, and, uh, and there was, you know, as I said, there was an attempt in those days to try to find some sort of theory along those lines. Now, interestingly enough, Fred himself at some point wrote a paper where he argued that I didn't say quite anything goes, obviously, but in fact, it wasn't just simply some, it's certainly not a Kaletsky simple markup rule. It's a lot more complicated the system, and indeed, even across sectors, you're dealing with very different types of pricing. You cannot, you cannot have a general system. I think that's what I would perhaps infer from what Fred uh, argued at one point on that. But indeed, it comes from that kind of tradition. Thank you. And any other questions or comments? We we'll have 10 more minutes. Becky, you should tell them about how, how uh, Fred, just stories about Fred being people's stories. About what? You could ask them to ask their audience if they have any stories about Fred being people's stories. Okay. Did you say you had one? Okay. Just a short thing. In, in the year 2001, Fred Lee and I both won the Gunnar Merdal Prize, awarded by the European Association for Political. Um, and I remember that the next year or so when we met, we were checking out each other what we did with that money. <laughs> And then it was very interesting to find out we bought a very similar thing, a musical instrument. <laughs> and the only difference, it was even the same type of instrument, the only difference was the size. He bought for his daughter a violin, and I bought a double bass for myself. <laughs> <laughs> and then the stories? About Fred Lee or? I also have the story when I met Debbie that was just super funny. I went to study, I thought Fred Lee was Asian, right? Yes, Lee yes. was Asian, right? And I, I mean, so I went to the University of Great Kansas City and I was one of the first students there that did like a, you know, the teaching program and just kind of getting started and stuff. And I was making photocopies in the main office and this guy comes in and he's like, so who are you? Well, I'm Joel Spire. I come from Canada or whatever, right? And uh, he's, like, he's like, so what are you here to do? I said, well, I'm here to study you with uh, Randy Ray, Young Scrabble, Fred Lee. And uh, he's like, oh. And he's like, oh, well, I'm Fred Lee. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Actually, you know, what, what I do think is quite interesting from a sort of uh, generational perspective is you, you know, your memories uh, of Fred and the students' memories of Fred from what I guess from this past decade or the past 15 years. When I think of Fred, I think of, you know, the early 1980s and 
early 90s. You know, that's my kind of thing. And it's just interesting. Uh, it's just interesting to see that generation. It's interesting to see how he sort of directly influenced each one of you. Yeah, he was really special. Like, he would come in and he'd be like, Yeah, you know, you're going to have to do that. Yeah. And like, and uh, one time I think I was reading something of us or something, he's like, Garbage! <laughs> <laughs> garbage, garbage, garbage. Don't mess with garbage, and garbage goes in, garbage comes out. Don't even bother reading that stuff. All right, fine. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's really interesting to see that. Well, I was just heard from Fat White that. They lived in Saudi Arabia for a couple of years, so for some of you guys know. And Fred was very curious about everything. And one day, he found that there was a riot on the street in Saudi Arabia. So he went out with a camera. But for some reason, he got caught by the police. So he went to jail for a night. And what he did, or that night was reading Roy Hale the biography of John Maynard Keynes. He read it in jail. What did he read? Which one did he read? Uh, Roy Harold, biography of John Maynard Keynes. Well, probably. I wish we would close.